Wanted to give you a quick update. Uh, last week, we presented the opportunity to participate in some uh, purchasing a property in uh, Ecuador, the jungles of Ecuador, for the, uh, a leadership training center and seminary that's going to be built there. And the property cost $5,000, and so we asked our church family to consider uh, being a part of that. I'm happy to report to you today that last week almost $8,000 came in. And now let's just. <laughs> I can't tell you how much it means to me that in the middle of our own expansion project, we don't just think about ourselves. That our church family says that there are other places, there are other people, there are other things that God is doing, and we want to support that too. And so in case you're wondering, does that mean that we pocket the rest of the money? No, we're going to send it all to them. That means that they can do a little bit more and a little bit faster, and so they will be thrilled. Uh, I get to send that email out to our missionary and let him know that, so I'm thrilled. We're continuing on. This is the ninth talk we've had in the book of Hebrews, and we're working our way through this uh, really remarkable uh, book, and we're in Hebrews chapter 11. This is probably the most famous chapter of the entire book of Hebrews, and it's kind of like the hall of fame for people who lived in faith. And so it begins by saying that now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So when I say the word faith, what comes to your mind? For a lot of people, it's a set of doctrines or beliefs that you adhere to or espouse. For other people, faith feels more like a hopeful outlook. They have faith that it's going to work out okay. For some people, they feel like it's kind of this ethereal mystery thing that comes and goes and may be fragile because some people talk about losing their faith. Other people see faith as kind of a crutch, something you lean on when you can't stand on your own strength. And some people consider faith to be outright foolishness. It's not uncommon for intellectuals to consider people of faith to be superstitious and silly. And... Um, so there, there is a, a lot of people who think that everything that happens in our world can be explained just by cause and effect. We, we don't need belief in something supernatural. Uh, here's the thing I want you to hear this morning. We can't learn about something by dismissing it. And so we're not going to learn anything about faith by just putting it away. And this passage actually reveals some things about faith that is surprising to religious people as it is to unreligious people. This passage kind of startles us with these snapshots of history and the influence that people had in people's life and through people's life. So here's some things I'd like you to know. The first is that faith is more solid than you know. It's more solid than you know. The King James Version actually says faith is the substance of things hoped for. The NIV, NIV uses uh, words like confidence and assurance. Now to be sure, there are people who think that faith is just a way to avoid dealing with real issues in life. In fact, you've probably heard of a guy by the name of Karl Marx who said that religion was the opiate of the people. 
He thought that religion was just like a drug that you take that keeps you from paying attention to the oppression that's going on in the world. And so that's why people are still stuck in situations they shouldn't tolerate. So that's a question, right? Is faith just a drug people take to make them feel better while they are dying? And this passage says something remarkably different. Uh, the author of Hebrews says it's more than just a feeling. That we look at people who live very different lives and faith influence their lives in different ways. This isn't a cookie cutter thing. It, it, it's not a, a reproduction thing in terms of getting the exact thing over and over again. It's something very different. He points out some individuals. And I wish I had time to go through all the individuals that he talks about in Hebrews 11. We'll just take a few. And he says, by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. That's a really interesting concept. It's a, a better sacrifice. Uh, Abel wasn't interested in just maintaining the status quo, doing the bare minimum to get by. He actually wanted to do a, a better sacrifice. There are people who want their lives to be better and our world to be better. And it requires a kind of faith for that to happen. And the question is, whose offering was it better than? And the answer is it was better than Cain's offering. That was his brother. There are few things that will make us angrier than someone doing something better than we did it. Isn't it true? Uh, let's suppose that uh, you know there's a, a school reunion coming up. And so you know for a year this has been true. So you've been hitting the gym, watching your caloric intake, having some clothes tailor fit, adding color to your hair, just doing everything you can to look your absolute best. And you walk into the room to discover that the person that looked better than you 20 years ago still does. <laughs> just ticks you off. How do they do that? It's not fair. Uh, we don't like to be told that someone has actually performed better than we have performed or done more than we have done or, or, or accomplished more than we have accomplished. It's a very bitter pill to swallow. It always has been. It started with Cain and Abel. We are not inspired by people who do better than us. We are incensed towards them. All someone has to do is succeed, and we will find reasons to criticize them. We want to bring them down a step or two. And that's what Cain does. He takes his brother's life. By the way, this is one of the reasons why Christianity is so offensive to people. You have to realize, for those of us that have kind of signed on and, and, and we believe this, we don't think in terms of offensiveness. But the Bible says that Jesus came and offered the better sacrifice. And that really annoys people because they want to believe that their efforts and their sacrifice is good enough. So people get very frustrated when they hear there's a sacrifice that was so good, it only happened, had to happen one time, and it was good for anyone who would avail themselves of it. It's just a remarkable thing. And, and then it says that Enoch. Enoch experienced something beyond death. He walked with God and just kept walking. I read a story one time that was written by a high school student that kind of created a story around this journey of Enoch. And he said, just one day when he was walking with God, God said, well, you're closer to my house than you are to yours. Just come to my house. <laughs> but he discovered that life is not all there is. We have one of our church family who's home in hospice today. And the number of days left are few, unless God miraculously intervenes. And I can tell you, her faith is strong, and she's a remarkably gracious person. But you have to know it's a heavy burden to bear. So how do you know there's anything past this? And faith helps us to figure that out. By faith, Noah built something that would rescue his family. He wasn't just an angry voice yelling at people who got too close. How many have ever seen someone with one of those giant billboards or placards that they're carrying around saying that, that the world is going to end or that God is going to judge the world and destroy it? Has anybody ever seen that? If you've been to a Bills game, there's always a person there doing that. And, and if you're a Bills fan, it's kind of believable because we haven't had a lot of good news for a long time. <laughs> Maybe this really is the end of the world. We don't know. But Noah discerned that destruction was coming, and he chose not to ignore it, and he chose not to blame people for it. 
He did something about it. He built something that would rescue people. That's a significant thing. That's what faith does. Faith doesn't just complain or blame. Faith says, I think I can do something that will make a difference. And he does that. His whole family is saved. Faith helped Abraham to take an adventurous journey that changed his life and the world. Faith is not about personal comfort. It's not about pain avoidance. There are a lot of people who think that's what faith is for. It's not. Faith is not about arranging our life so that nothing troubles us and nothing frustrates us and nothing scares us. That's not what faith is. Abraham left everything to go on this adventure. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Faith actually helps us understand that everything we see started with something that we can't see. That all of life is not actually an accident. That there is a creator who has designed us with value and with worth. That he has a purpose and a plan. This is what faith begins to unpack for us. Now people might expect that faith just provides positive feelings. It just makes you feel better. Feelings and faith are not the same thing. And here's what you need to know. Feelings make lousy decision makers. If you make your decisions based on your feelings, you're going to have a very bumpy ride because you're going to think you like people one day and you don't feel so good about them the next day. I mean, don't raise any hands. Don't even give knowing glances. Just stare straight ahead. Act like there's, this has no bearing on you. But have you felt completely in love and your feelings entirely positive every single day of your marriage? Probably not. And I know some of you are saying, it wasn't faith that kept me going. I don't think they're ever going to change. It's just, <laughs> I'm just not letting them off the hook that easy. That's, that's not faith. So faith is more solid than you know. Faith is also more than you know. It's more than what you know. This is kind of interesting. Some people think that if you pursue faith, you're not allowed to think. You're not allowed to learn. The Bible never instructs us to avoid knowledge. Faith is not intimidated by knowledge. Some people are afraid that if they advance their education, they're going to find a piece of information that just disintegrates their faith, that they'll learn something and and it will just say, oh, that proves that God doesn't exist. You should know there are incredibly highly educated and brilliant people who have deep devotion to God. Our education doesn't destroy our faith. The problem with knowledge is not that it can destroy our faith or disprove our faith. The problem with knowledge is that it's capable of making us arrogant. Right? Isn't that what we say? We we say someone is a know-it. Oh, yeah, that's never a compliment. If someone said it to you, they were not being nice. Even in biblical learning, people can learn a lot about the Bible and they become arrogant about it. And faith actually leads to humility, not to arrogance. Knowing something doesn't mean you know everything, and what we know could be wrong or it could become outdated. Um, My uh, daughter has a daughter, almost a year old, and all the rules for parenting on, on how, what you're allowed to feed them and all the things about whether they can have a blanket in the bed. All those rules change like every five years. And I'm trying to figure out what, why are they changing? What's the difference? And there are people who just decide to try something and then they try to make a rule out of it. But in five years, it'll probably be outdated again. Increased knowledge benefits humanity. I'm grateful that if I get a scratch and it gets infected, it won't kill me. I can get an antibiotic and I will live to tell the tale. I'm grateful. I was 400 miles away from Rochester yesterday and I got in my car and I'm here. I could travel at a pace faster than 20 miles a day. When you can only travel 20 miles a day, you don't go very far. So I'm grateful for all of that. And God intends that people use their intellectual capacity to benefit humanity. But of course, the challenge is is that we don't just use our capacity to benefit humanity. Sometimes we use our capacity to destroy humanity. And that's part of the human problem. So education is not an enemy of faith. 
There's uh, four guys in the Old Testament. Their names are Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they'd actually been abducted from their homeland and taken to Babylon. And the reason they were taken is because they showed a lot of potential. And so they were educated in all the math, the sciences, and the literature of Babylon. And when they took their tests, they actually exceeded. Their, sc their scores excelled beyond everyone else's who was taking the test. But this is what's interesting. Their education did not destroy their faith. Their education, though, also did not make them brave. It was their faith that made them brave. When they were threatened with certain death, and painful death, if they did not bow down and worship at the command of the king, an image that had been set up, it was their faith that helped them to be brave in that moment. It was their faith that gave them an option. Lots of other people had the same education, and when the command came from the king, they just dropped to the ground when they were told to. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a different response and it was faith that drove that. You don't have to check your brains at the door when you walk into a faith community. If somebody asks you not to learn and not to think and not to question, it is not faith that is motivating them. It is fear. And in our culture, there's a lot of fear that masquerades as faith. So faith is more than what you know. And uh, I seem to be going backwards. Faith enables you to go. Abraham's life was as good as you could want it to be in the ancient world. He had resources, he had family, he had influence, and on the further end of his age range, God whispers to his heart and tells him he needs to leave where he is. God told him, he said, I will lead you to a place, but he didn't tell him where it was, and he didn't tell him how long it would take to get there. So why would Abraham even consider that option? I mean, what if it didn't work out? What if he failed? What if he lost everything? You know, what's driving his behavior to, to consider doing this? There are some people who wonder, was he just bored? Just gotta, I got to get out of this place and do something. Was he frustrated with uh, the political system or with his family? Was he afraid of something where he was? And Scripture reveals that none of those things drove his behavior. What drove his decision to follow that prompting to step out was faith. And that's exactly the opposite. This surprises us. It's the exact opposite of how some people think about faith. They think that faith is supposed to make life easier and more predictable. We don't want any anxiety. We don't want to feel any risk. And that's not how Scripture talks about faith. Now, don't get me wrong. Faith is not just risk-taking behavior. Faith is not about taking risks. Faith is about being obedient to God regardless of the risk. That's the difference. Faith is trusting that God's intention towards you is actually good. And, it's, and this is interesting. It's willing to take a step even when you don't know how long or how far you're going to go. The Bible says we walk by faith. One step after another step after another step. And this is what's fascinating. Every step that Abraham takes out of the land of Ur, every step he takes away from his homeland, when he takes that step, he sees himself a little bit differently. He sees his community a little bit differently. And he sees God a little bit differently. And then he takes another step. And he sees himself and the world around him and God just a little bit differently. If your perspective of yourself or our world or God hasn't changed in a long time, it's not because you reached the end of learning it all. It's because you haven't taken a step of faith in a while. Because every time you take a step of faith, it changes how you see so I'd like us to bow our heads this morning. So this is the question I can imagine you asking. And if you haven't imagined it yet, as soon as I say these questions, you'll, it'll make sense to you. So 
So what might God ask me to do? Where might God ask me to go? What might God require of me or ask me to let go of? And I don't know the answer to those questions. But don't you want to know the answer to those questions? We will never discover the purpose that God has created us for or step into the fullness that he has for us by just always choosing comfort over everything else. If we only operate in what we know, we can't get to where God wants us. So this journey of faith becomes mission critical. That there are things that are more important than our comfort or our security or reducing all of our anxiety or making our life so predictable. That's not... That's not what the life of faith is about. It's an adventure. It's a discovery. And every step you take, you gain kind of a new perspective and a, a, a greater depth of understanding about who you are, about who is around you, and about a God who's leading you. Don't you want to know what that is? So here's what I'd like you to do. Just while your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, and I just want you to ask God, what's the next step? Don't ask him, where is this all going? Don't ask him, how much is this going to cost me? All of those things are a long way down the journey. Ask him, what's the next step you want me to take? And I want you to pay attention to the thoughts that come to you. I can't guarantee that they're from God, but they could be. And wouldn't you want to know if they were? So let's just take a half a minute. something came to your mind, I want, I want you to take that seriously. And I don't know every, everywhere it'll lead you, but take it seriously. Maybe you were sitting there and in that half a minute, nothing came to your mind. That's okay. Uh, this is worth taking some time and spending some time in a conversation with God. We often talk to God about the things we want him to do for us. It's a really good idea to have conversations with God about what he wants you to do with him. And so I would just encourage that conversation to continue. Heavenly Father, we don't just want to settle for less than what you intend. We, we don't want to... We tend to, be, to withdraw, to hold back, to hang on to, and what we'd rather do is take a step of faith and find out what you intend for our life, not just what we tend to do. We thank you for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.